right time to stop using normal saline. So I want to start by talking about an assassination. At a hospital far away in a time long ago, there was a patient who presented to the emergency department. The patient had a history of type 1 diabetes. He'd been feeling ill for a couple days. He was tachypneic, and on presentation, he was noted to be hypotensive and tachycardic and clearly quite dry and, and really kind of looking like he had um, DKA. So he rolls in the door, he's you know quite volume depleted, and he was initially given three liters of normal saline wide open. And shortly thereafter, he went into ventricular tachycardia, got intubated, coded, and actually ended up surviving, which I don't understand how he survived, but he did. Um, and the question here is why did this guy who'd been doing okay for you know a couple days suddenly just kind of like code in the ED and I think this is what happened. Um, studies in the OR randomized control trials have shown that normal saline causes acidosis and this actually drives potassium out of cells. And in RCTs comparing normal saline versus lactated ringers, normal saline has been shown to cause spikes in the potassium level. And my belief is that every once in a while, someone rolls into an emergency department or has terrible hyperkalemia, receives a bunch of normal saline, this increases their potassium and kind of pushes them off the ledge and causes them to have a ventricular tachycardia. And I don't think that this is common, um, but I do think that this probably exists um, maybe like once every decade or something at, at like a low enough risk that no one's gonna really notice it. So as I mentioned before, my viewpoint is that saline is contraindicated in hyperkalemia and lactated ringers is preferable in hyperkalemia. And there's a whole blog about that. Um, so that's one reason that I think normal saline is a terrible solution to use as your crystalloid of choice for kind of random patients that you encounter. Um, but the, the much bigger reason to be concerned about normal saline is the issue of hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. four liters of normal saline is going to have roughly the same pH effect on a patient compared to getting four liters of lactated ringers and 100 MEQs of hydrochloric acid. Now, I don't know if you've ever given a patient IV hydrochloric acid. I have, and it took me hours to persuade everyone that it was okay to do that. Um, and the doses that I was giving weren't that much you know, greater than this. So, it's kind of interesting, if you're going to give someone 100 MEQs of hydrochloric acid by itself, your pharmacist is going to lose their mind. But if you give someone normal saline, which has the same exact pH effect, nobody cares. Um, and I think this is because this kind of runs underneath the radar. Now, um, at the talk, someone tweeted this out, it said Goon actually, and um, this generated like this angry tweet storm. People accused me of being fear mongering, a prominent nephrologist said that this was bullshit. Um, so I went back and I recalculated everything and re-verified the numbers. Um, and I, those numbers are shown below in the blog and there's actually some more evidence about this. So I think the best numbers that I could come up with are four liters of normal saline is equal to 4.5 liters of LR and 126 MBQs of hydrochloric acid. I was, the, the prior slide, I was just trying to get the concept out there um, I think these numbers are slightly more precise, but I think the bottom line here is that when you're giving someone a lot of normal saline, you're giving them a considerable amount of acid compared to the same amount of volume with a balanced crystalloid. And this is a physiochemical fact, okay? So normal saline causes hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. It causes a, a substantial you know, base deficit. This is a fact. You can't debate that. That's been proven in multiple RCTs, it's, it's just basic chemistry. You cannot debate that. Um, you, you can debate the significance of that acidosis and whether it matters, but you can't debate whether or not it exists. So th this leads to the question of get, getting back on track here. Sorry, so who cares? So we know that normal saline causes hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. That's a fact. It's been shown um, and, and really it's beyond question at this point, but the, the, what is debatable is does this hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis cause harm to patients? Is it clinically meaningful or is it just a number um, that we're getting upset about? 
And I think there are a couple lines of evidence that hypochloremic metabolic acidosis is actually bad for patients. Um, so probably the number one concern that folks have about hypochloremic metabolic acidosis is that it may cause renal dysfunction. And the way this works is tubuloglomerular feedback. So if you can remember back to medical school, the way the tubule regulates the amount of flow going through the tubule is by measuring the chloride content. If the chloride content of fluid inside the tubule is high, the kidney senses this and it thinks that fluid is going too quickly through the kidney and it responds to that by vasoconstriction. So hyperchloremia causes renal vasoconstriction. And this has been shown in animal models and it has also been shown in human volunteers. There was an interesting study that looked at volunteers getting two liters of normal saline versus two liters of plasmolite. And the folks who got the plasmolite actually had better flow to their kidneys on renal ultrasound. So there's a variety of evidence that hyperchloremia can cause renal vasoconstriction. The second kind of concern um, about hyperchloremia is that it may cause hypotension. So we are all familiar with this concept that severe or profound metabolic acidosis can cause catecholamine resistance. So our patient with a pH of 6.6 may not respond well to vasopressors, uh, or at least catecholamine vasopressors. I think everyone is vaguely familiar with that. Um, but it also looks like a similar effect may occur even with mild amounts of metabolic acidosis. Um, so this was a randomized controlled trial, once again, in the anesthesiology literature, comparing folks going to the OR, getting a balanced crystalloid versus saline. And you can see that the patients getting saline need vasopressors substantially more. And if you look at the study, the interesting thing here is that the difference in bicarb is relatively mild. And what this is suggesting is that even a mild acidosis may have some effect on your hemodynamics. Um, and this has been shown in animal studies and also a couple human studies. And then I think the last concern with hyperchloric metabolic acidosis is that it may cause inflammation. This has been shown in animal models. And here is a human study of patients with pancreatitis who were randomized to receive lactated ringers versus normal saline. And what you can see is that the patients treated with saline had higher levels of C-reactive protein, greater levels of inflammation. And of course, in pancreatitis, CRP correlates with bad outcomes. So there is some potential clinical tie-in here. This randomized control trial has been replicated with the same exact results in a second randomized control trial. So I think this is reasonable, reasonable evidence. Um, now, so, so those are several pieces of evidence from animal literature, clinical evidence, that normal saline is potentially harmful. What is the evidence that we should be using normal saline? What is the argument in favor of using normal saline? I've had this discussion with lots of folks over a long period of time, and I've been unable to really uncover a compelling physiologic or clinical reason that we should use normal saline. Um, most of the time, arguments are along the lines of, A, normal saline is cheap, um, it's compatible with lots of drugs, it's what we use, it's what we've always used, and it seems to work. None of those are a really compelling scientific rationale to use this drug. Um, if you went to a patient and said, hey, we're going to use this drug because it's kind of cheap and it's the way we always did it, I'm not sure the patient would be really excited about that. Um, and I think what really underlies our use of normal saline is largely status quo bias. And this is a bias that whatever it is that we do, whatever it is that we have been doing and whatever we've been trained to do, that must be good and it must be right because that's how we were trained and, um, and we're good doctors and you know we're, we do good medicine. Um, and, and clearly this is often wrong and this is not a good scientific rationale to do any therapy. The other bias at play here is false equivalence fallacy. And you see this in the news a lot. So when two candidates are compared to one another, there's, they're almost like put on an even keel and there's this underlying assumption that they're kind of equivalent to one another because they're running against each other. Um, and certainly that's not true. Um, and I think the same kind of phenomenon goes on with lactated ringers and normal saline. Since they're both crystalloids and we kind of use them in similar fashion, a lot of clinical trials kind of put them on an even keel and there's this kind of assumption that they're kind of equivalent. 
But I would propose that the amount of evidence underlying the use of lactated ringers and the clinical rationale and the basic science is much, much better than any sort of evidence supporting normal saline, which basically doesn't really exist. And I think this leads to the question of, do we even need clinical trials to show that you know lactated ringers is superior? How much more evidence do we need? Um, I've already reviewed a number of kind of small clinical trials and animal research and basic physiology um, suggesting that lactated ringers is superior. If you're going to say that you care about pH status and you want the patient to have a, a normal pH and you want the electrolytes to be relatively normal and you think normal physiology is kind of a reasonable thing to shoot for, then lactated ringers is what you should choose. You don't need a huge randomized control trial to tell you that. Um, that's basic chemistry. Um, so th this is an interesting article by J.L. Vincent, and I think there's actually a lot of truth here. Um, I love evidence-based medicine, but at the same time, I think there is potentially an argument to say that, um, you know, there's a lot of strong physiologic evidence that LR is superior in Normal saline was kind of like a historical artifact that people started using for, for no reason, and there's no reason that we should be using it. Um, so I don't know that we necessarily need like a super great evidence basis to stop using it. That being said, um, recently some, some good trials came out about this. So this was a SALT ED trial um, out of Vanderbilt that was recently released in the New England Journal of Medicine. This was a cluster randomized trial involving a ton of patients admitted to their emergency department. These were patients admitted from the ED to the hospital ward. They were generally receiving about a liter, liter and a half of fluid, not a ton of fluid, not super sick patients, and they were randomized to receive normal saline versus lactated ringers. Excuse me, normal saline versus balanced crystalloid. However, the vast majority who were randomized to balanced crystalloid actually ended up getting LR. So this was functionally a study comparing NS versus LR. The primary endpoint was a composite of acute kidney injury, dialysis, or death. And what they showed is that patients treated with lactated ringers had a 1% reduction in this composite endpoint, which was really driven by a reduction in acute kidney injury. Um, and I think this is a neat study um, I think it's, it's relatively surprising, honestly, that they found any difference at all. Um, if you look at, you know, the fact that these patients weren't super sick, they did not get a lot of fluid, um, a priori, I would not have expected to see a big difference here. Um, but I think the patient, this study was so well powered that they were able to show this difference. Now you could argue, what is the clinical significance of a 1% reduction in AKI? That does not sound super impressive. Um, but I think the key thing here is that the choice of normal saline versus LR, um, those two fluids have extremely similar cost. The cost differential is like pennies or nickels or something. Um, and it's not hard to choose LR versus normal saline. Um, so it's extremely easy and basically almost cost neutral to implement this therapy. And then if you kind of consider a 1% reduction in AKI leveraged across thousands of patients admitted to hospitals you know, everywhere, you can actually begin to imagine that this could have a huge beneficial impact. Um, and at the conference, it was kind of funny because after I finished my talk on this, later on, there was a talk on evidence-based medicine, and they kind of went through this trial and poked a bunch of holes in it. Um, I still think this was a pretty valid trial, um, and, and the flaws that were found in it, I think, really are not tremendously persuasive. Um, and I think the other issue, too, is just to say that... Um, I'm not suggesting that we stop our, that we change our practice based solely on this trial. I think this trial is one piece of evidence in a constellation of evidence that's painting a very consistent clinical picture. Um, but that was a little amusing. Um, so moving right along, the SMART trial. Um, so this was another cluster randomized trial by the same group at Vanderbilt, published in the same edition of the New England Journal. Um, and in this trial, they were looking at patients admitted from the emergency department to the ICU. Um, also randomized to balanced crystalloid versus normal saline. They had the same composite outcome of kidney injury or dialysis or death. And what was really interesting here, so the folks who got balanced crystalloid saw a 1% reduction in this composite outcome. But 
What was interesting about this study is that this composite wasn't actually driven so much by AKI, it was actually driven more by mortality, which I find interesting. Um, I think it suggests that maybe, you know, some of this like hyperchloremia causes inflammation and hyperchloremia causes hypotension. Maybe that stuff that I was talking about earlier could have some sort of impact above and beyond or aside from any specific, you know, impact on kidney injury. That's, that's all kind of hypothetical, but I think the bottom line is this is another trial that kind of adds more evidence to the fact that, you know, balanced crystalloids are probably superior. So, um, if we're going to say the balanced crystalloids are better, how can we kind of implement this at the ground level? And I think it's important to work through some contraindications that are bogus. So as mentioned multiple times already, I do not believe that hyperkalemia is a contraindication to using lactated ringers. I did a blog about this, um, a lot of discussion about it, and you know I'll reference that blog in the show notes. Um, the, the bottom line is, hyperkalemia is not a contraindication to LR. LR is never going to cause hyperkalemia. It's just not, it's not physiologically possible. The other concern that folks have with regards to giving lactated ringers is cirrhosis. Um, so there is some concern that cirrhotics may not be able to metabolize the lactate. And there are a couple reasons that LR is perfectly fine to use in cirrhosis. So the first reason is the liver is really good at metabolizing lactate. So unless the liver is totally dead, it's gonna be fine. The liver will be able to metabolize the lactate. So don't worry about it. The second reason that this is not a problem is even if the liver is completely dead and has zero function at all, um, lactate bringers contain sodium lactate. It does not contain lactic acid. So giving someone sodium lactate is perfectly fine. It's not going to cause an acidosis. Um, the sodium lactate can actually be used as metabolic fuel by the heart and the brain. So um, bottom line, lactate ringers is fine in cirrhosis. Um, and then the last one, um, folks are sometimes hesitant to use lactated ringers because they're concerned that it may affect the patient's lactate level if they're going all crazy with a CEP3 and checking a bunch of lactate levels. Um, and I think the bottom line here is that it's going to have a minimal effect on the lactate level. It's not really clinically significant. Um, so don't worry about this. Um, I think the only, you know, legitimate contraindication to using lactated ringers is a critically elevated intracranial pressure. Um, LR is hypotonic. It's only slightly hypotonic, but it is hypotonic. So theoretically, the risk does exist that um, if someone had super elevated intracranial pressure and you gave them like a huge amount of lactated ringers, you could make that worse. In reality, I think this is somewhat unlikely. Um, the LR is not that hypotonic. Um, and it's kind of equivalent to giving like a bag of antibiotics mixed in D5. I don't think it's going to break the bank, but I think if you know that the patient has an increased ICP, this is not the best choice of fluid for that patient. So if you know the patient has a high ICP, choose plasma light, choose normal salt, choose something else. Um, but I think the, the bottom line here is that, you know, I use lactated runners as my default fluid for basically every patient, especially patients who I don't quite know, I don't know their electrolytes, I don't know what's going on with them. And if you use LR as a default resuscitative fluid, you're not going to cause harm 99.9% .9 of the time, which I think is far better than the normal saline. So what's the bottom line here? Um, more studies are going to be coming out. There are probably gonna be some under, underpowered studies coming out soon that show no benefit, and there's gonna be persistent debate about this forever. But I think if you look at the whole balance between what is the evidence to support normal saline and what is the evidence to support balanced crystalloid, I really think that this balance is tipping definitively in favor of balanced crystalloids. Um, so my, my current practice, my, cur my practice for the past couple of years um, is I really think it's time to stop bolusing patients with saline. Obviously giving them like saline as a, you know, rider for an infusion is, is fine, but um, I don't think we should be bolusing our patients with, with tons of saline. All right. Thanks so much.